Coming up, the face of America is changing. The strongest growth that we've experienced has come from the Latin community. And it's strengthening the church along the way. We will be a very healthy church committed to righteousness, but likewise committed to biblical justice in the name of Jesus. Then, there was something tragically wrong with this child. A baby with a rare defect. He says, I'm not sure if he'll make it. And parents who held on to hope. And you're going to listen to me. You are going to live. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. We're glad to have you with us. We've got some exciting things to talk about today. Uh, but, you know, we consider what happened in Las Vegas. It was terrible slaughter, but it would have been much worse were it not for the heroic effort of individuals who actually were willing to give their lives to save others. And President Trump honored them in his visit to Vegas on Wednesday. Well, there was another side to the president's trip, and it's one that you won't see in the mainstream news. Trump also spoke with local pastors about the tragedy. Ben Kennedy brings us the story from Las Vegas. The stories of survival are nothing less than incredible. As President Trump met with first responders, doctors, nurses, and even those who risked their own life for strangers. In the depths of horror, we will always find hope in the men and women who risk their lives for hours. The commander in chief used words like amazing and incredible when talking about the first responders and medical teams. It makes you very proud to be an American when you see the job that they've done. Visiting Las Vegas following the worst mass shooting in American history, President Trump met with victims and gave his personal thanks to officers and even honored civilians who put aside their own safety to protect others. Americans dashed into a hail of bullets to rescue total strangers. And while in Las Vegas, Trump also met with local pastors. Shook our hands and told us, pastors, thank you for being here. Pastor Pasquale Arabazo got the chance to talk to the president and first lady one on one. What did it mean to you to have President Trump here shaking your hand during this time of tragedy? It, it meant a whole lot, it, not only to me, but I believe to the whole city because this city needed him at this time and he showed up. Pastor Vance Pittman of Hope Church Las Vegas agrees, adding that Trump continues to turn to God in times of tragedy. People ask the question, where's God in all of this? And I, I mean, God's right in the middle of it. God was drawing people to himself through this and, and saving people. May God bring healing to the families of the wounded, the injured and the fallen. The president was only in the desert for a few hours, but in that short period of time had a big impact in the wake of this tragedy as police continue their investigation right here behind me into the motive behind this massacre. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Las Vegas. Thanks, Ben. One of the survivors of the horrible slaughter Sunday has a remarkable story to tell because God already had someone praying for him weeks before the attack. This is an amazing story. John Jessup has it. Well, that's right, Pat. While many survivors of the mass shooting in Las Vegas have learned about the power of prayer, one in particular saw his family's prayers answered in real time. Stephanie Riggs caught up with a young man named Chris Hahn near the scene of the crime along the Las Vegas Strip. How old are you? 27. Today. <laughs> Chris Hahn has reason to celebrate his life after surviving the mass shooting in Las Vegas, where he found himself in a sea of panic. The first thing I thought of was um, to call my mom. Um, honestly, the first reaction was just to have her on the phone and say I love you and um, just, to, just to talk to someone while this went down. As he ran for cover with thousands of other terrified souls, his mom began to pray. She didn't cry, she didn't panic. She um, uh, just said it's all right. It's all right, we're gonna pray, you're gonna be protected. Uh, we're gonna ask God for his protection. And uh, at that moment, and I'm sure she was as terrified as can be. I mean, you could still hear the gunshots ringing out and screaming. Uh, she just started to pray with me and, and, and say, we, we need your protection right now, Lord. We need you to, to protect him. Han says he found an immediate sense of peace and rallied for those around him and suddenly remembered a phone call from his sister a few weeks ago. She's like, it's just, I feel this really strong, this really strong urge to pray for you. And, and God's just telling me that you're going to be, uh, 
you're going to be under fire. And that's funny, she actually said those words. But at the time, I just thought, under fire, I know that could be a lot of things. God only knows what really happened here just a few days ago in Las Vegas. But this bright young real estate agent plans to trust him and keep going. This isn't humanly possible, that there's other things involved and there's evil in this world. And um, it's, it's just watching God come into play now and helping people heal and um, just watching the outreach of people that don't even know each other. Thanks, Stephanie. Well, turning overseas to Europe after unprecedented violence against its own citizens Sunday, Spain is headed for another showdown with the renegade province of Catalonia, which wants to become an independent state. And Catalonia may not be alone. Independence movements in other European countries may spring up as well. Dale Hurd has a story. With its capital in Barcelona, Catalonia has its own history, culture and language. Catalonia also pays more in taxes to the Spanish government in Madrid than it gets back. And many Catalans want to be free of Spain. There are reports the Catalan parliament will consider a declaration of independence from Spain on Monday. Europeans were shocked at the extraordinary level of violence directed against Catalans trying to vote Sunday in a referendum on independence that the Spanish government declared illegal. It had made many wonder just how free and democratic the European Union really is. A former leader of the Czech Republic who grew up under communism came to Brussels and he gave a speech. And he told EU lawmakers that the European Union reminded him of the Soviet Union. And he was booed. But this violence could easily remind at least some Europeans about what life was like in the totalitarian governments behind the Iron Curtain. Almost 900 were injured by police. I've called the European Union undemocratic, I've called it anti-democratic, but never, ever, in, in my fiercest criticisms here, did I think we would see the police of a member state of the Union injuring 900 people in an attempt to stop them going out to vote. We saw women being dragged out of polling stations by their hair, old ladies with gashes in their forehead. And what do we get from Mr. Juncker today? Not a dicky bird. Catalans viewed the vote as a democratic expression of free speech and self-determination. But the European Commission has sided firmly with the government in Madrid and said the Spanish government's use of force was necessary to uphold the rule of law. The independence movement in Catalonia is a big problem for the European Union because there are many regions of Europe, most notably Flanders in the northern half of Belgium, where other separatist movements also want to break away and declare their own nations. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. Pat, those were some startling images to see. Well, you know, these countries are cobbled together by politicians. And their, the natural relationship uh, was, for example, in Belgium. You know, the, the Dutch uh, and, and the, the uh, Flemish, the Wallons and so forth, the, they've had en enmity for years. And all of a sudden, uh, somebody has come together and said, well, you need to have one nation. Well, those people still don't like each other the way they should. And so they don't really want to be together. And the, the idea of one nation is certainly is true in the Middle East, where a lot of those nations, like Iraq, are creatures of European powers. And they begin to say, no, we don't want that. We think we ought to have independence of independent groups. And you're going to find more and more and more of that. And uh, will it tear things apart? Well, is that bad? I'm not sure it is bad. All right. Yeah. Well, Pat, in health news, about 40% of all cancer cases in the United States are linked to being either obese or overweight. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control. The extra weight isn't necessarily causing the cancers, but it does increase the risk. While the overall rate of cases has been falling since the 1990s, the rate of cancer related to obesity has been rising, affecting more than twice as many women as men. And some of the cancers, like colon, pancreatic, breast, and others, are among the worst. And Pat, as you well know, a whopping two-thirds of Americans are considered either overweight or obese. Uh, it is appalling what's happening. And I pointed some time ago to high fructose corn syrup, which I think is present in so many foods. We load our foods up 
the grocery uh, vendors load their food up with uh, substances that make us want to eat more of them. And that high fructose corn syrup is something you find in baby food, and it's all the way up and down the chain. And we have an epidemic of, of obesity, and it's causing uh, type 2 diabetes. It's causing serious health problems. And now they're talking about heart conditions and cancer. Uh, the whole idea of inflammation is the root cause of so many diseases. It's inflammation. And the inflammation is caused because we have so many impurities in our bodies, so much sweets, so much uh, uh, white flour and things like that. Uh, and the way we process our food is killing us. I mean, it's, it's a shame. Yeah. You know, I just bought some lunch things for my granddaughter the other day, and, yeah. and right on the juice box, now it's actually saying no high fructose corn syrup. I mean, they, people are on to it. Well, they, maybe know? they're listening to this program. <laughs> maybe. Well, you know, we did a thing on, on MSG and showed how many soups have it, and I was showing camel soups, and they had MSG, and they began to advertise, no, we're not doing it anymore. Progresso was the one that didn't have any MSG. Mm -hmm. But MSG is an excitotoxin, and it's, it's in so much food. And they're loading this stuff up, and it's bad for you, ladies and gentlemen. So where do you shop? Go to the outer aisle of the grocery store where the fresh fruit is and the fresh vegetables and eat them. That's what you ought to be eating if possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, coming up, the major demographic shift that's shaking up churches across America. There's the idea or the perception in white evangelicalism and even in the African-American church, the Latinos are this emerging immigrant group. We are not emerging. We emerge. See how churches are adapting to this new Latino reformation. Plus, time for another round of Your Questions, Honest Answers. Diane says... My husband left me after 30 years of marriage. The only thing he keeps me around for is sex. He puts forth no effort to reconcile, and I'm tired of it. Am I free to remarry? Pat weighs in on that and more right after this. Well, welcome back. It's time for your questions and some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Diane, who says, My husband left me after 30 years of marriage. He wanted to be by himself and do what he wanted. He stopped going to church. It has now been six years, and I have tried everything I know to win him back. He puts forth no effort to come back, but thinks I should still have sex with him. I have gone along with his thinking, but he doesn't seem to want anything else. We are divorced. I'm tired of this. Am I free to remarry? We both were raised in conservative Christian homes. Um, you know, the Pauline privilege is something that I've mentioned quite a few times. Uh, Paul said, if the unbelieving spouse is pleased to depart, let him depart. The brother or sister is not bound in that case. And I think if your husband has departed, uh, but you're, he, he hasn't really uh, severed the tie, and you're still having sex with him. Uh, so you're still joining together uh, in some kind of union. And uh, I, I think before somebody could say that that union is irrevocably broken, uh, you, you're the one that needs to break it off. If you continue to have sex with him, then you're continuing to be one flesh. You're joined together. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So if he has abandoned you, he's walked out and left you, then of course you're free to go get married again. That's what the Bible says. Okay. Okay, this is Maria who says, Pat, I have a 55-year-old single brother who lives two blocks from my 84-year-old mother and me. Our father died five years ago, and my brother has never once helped me and my sister with my mom's needs. Our mother and I helped raise my brother's daughter, and ever since she grew up, he has ignored us. My son had his graduation party this summer. My brother never came or sent a card. He instead went drinking and golfing with his friends. 
My question is, when I see my brother at his daughter's house as a Christian, do I have to look him in the eye and say hi and give him a hug like nothing has happened? Or can I give him the cold shoulder? Would God approve of me ignoring him? I, I think what God would like best is if you would go to him and say, listen, I have ought against you, and here's what it is. Uh, you know, you have ignored us. You have not participated. You're not helping us support the, 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 our mutual yeah. uh, parents. And uh, you don't show up at uh, your, your nephew's graduation or whatever. I think talk to him about those things. That's what you ought to do. Don't just give him a cold shoot. He won't know what the, what's going on. And don't expect him to be a mind reader. So I think the, the best thing you can do is to confront him. That's what the Bible says. You confront him and lay it out. And if he won't <laughs> receive you under those circumstances, you might bring somebody, uh, you know, to have a witness uh, along with it. And then, then you can treat him like an infidel if you want to. But <laughs> up to that point, you don't do it. All right. Okay. This is Cindy who says, God says he loves us the way we are. But once we go to heaven, we're judged for what we've done on earth. How is it that God loves us the way we are, but judges our sins? When someone loves you, they're supposed to love who you are no matter what. Well, I, I think you're making up all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know that the Bible says God loves us the way we are. I don't know. I don't. Know. He loves us in spite of the way we are. I don't know where that is in the Bible. Do you? No, I don't. I've never seen that. That's, I'm sure people preach that way, and they say, "Well, God loves us the way you are." Well, yes and no. <clears throat> but look, the Bible says we will give account for what we do in the body, and it's. Not that God doesn't love you. It's that this is the way he's ordered the world. And we'll all stand before the Bema. Now, we will not go into the final judgment. He that has, you know, you believe in God and, and, and trust his word, believe on the Son of God, uh, you have everlasting life. You're passed from death into life. But in terms of what you're doing day by day by day, there is a reward and there is a punishment. Uh, I, I would hope, in fairness, God would give to people who've worked hard in his vineyard for 20 or 30 years, he'd give them a little break. <laughs> he doesn't have to, but it'd be nice if he did. And that's sort of what the Bible says, that there's going to be a sc scorecard of the way you've lived. That doesn't mean he doesn't love you, but the idea that he loves us just the way we are, uh, that is not, there's nothing in the Bible that says that. He, 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 he loves us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. He loves us. He loves us. But at the same time, he doesn't condone the sin we're engaged in. All right? Okay, this is Denise who says, My daughter has been going to a church for years that teaches that you cannot remarry after divorce. Her husband doesn't believe the Bible and tells his three children the Bible is a book of lies. He frequently screams and calls his three kids idiots and curses his own wife, using the Lord's name in vain. She says she feels like she's living in hell, but according to her church, she can leave but never remarry. Is that what the Bible says? Uh, no, the Bible doesn't quite say it that way. Um, the Bible does indicate that if you remarry, without appropriate grounds as you're committing adultery. Uh, but in, in the case, you know, I think there's what would be considered constructive desertion. I, I think if, if an unbeliever is deserting, uh, you're, you're not bound. And I think that's constructive. That husband is making it so difficult, you can't live with him. Uh, and he's, but the idea the church is not telling it quite the way the Bible says, okay? Mm -hmm. right. This is Sandra who says, our church was asked by our denomination to make packages to be sent to the areas affected by the hurricanes this fall. They insisted that the packages have no mention of Jesus or even that they were supplied by a Christian organization. How are we to respond to this? I think I'd yeah. make my packages someplace else. You know, there was something called the Christian Children's Fund. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. And they mm -hmm. changed it to Child Fund. And it just grated on me something terrible. I don't know whether their contributions went down. They should have. But I think the idea, you know, we at Christian Broadcasting Network are unashamedly Christian. 
At Regent University, we're unashamedly Christian. And I think we need to be unashamedly Christian. And the idea that you have, you don't put anything on a package because, about, about Jesus, that's wrong. You're denying the Lord. And, and that church is, if you'll excuse my saying so, is a sinning against God. Mm -hmm. right. Well, no, because that, he says that when we let our light shine in the world, then the world sees See, him. That's so right. we're supposed to. Well, you're supposed yeah. to do it. Of course you are. All right. Well, this year, the world is marking the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. It began 500 years ago. And there's talk of a new major movement in the church underway right now. As Heather Sells tells us, some Hispanic leaders call it the Latino Reformation. On any given Sunday at the Crossing Church in Tampa, you'll see a mix of ages, backgrounds, and races. In Florida, almost a quarter of the population is Hispanic, so churches here are already benefiting from their involvement and leadership. Since 2013, the Latino population has just exploded around here, and we, we're seeing it. Two of our main worship pastors are Latino. They're amazing, and they bring kind of the salsa flair, the fire, if you will. Um, our student pastor and our campus pastor in South Shore are both Latino. As part of this new generation of Hispanic leadership, senior pastor Greg Dumas fits a growing trend. He doesn't speak Spanish and barely identifies himself as Hispanic. I'm Latino, kind of. <laughs> Still, Dumas is well aware of his congregation's diversity. We almost exactly represent Tampa. When you talk about African-American, white, Latino. The crossing is right on cue with a Latino population surge reshaping not just the country, but our churches. By 2050, one in three Americans will be Latino. Combine that with phenomenal church growth across Latin America and add Pope Francis, and you get a modern day Latino reformation. Authors Robert Crosby and Samuel Rodriguez make that case in their new book, When Faith Catches Fire. There's the idea or the perception in white evangelicalism and even in the African-American church, the Latinos are this emerging immigrant group. Misnomer, we emerged. We are not emerging. We emerged. We're here. And, and we're here in, in viable leadership roles. Rodriguez says the rise of Latino Christians in the U.S. is no coincidence. He believes they may not only bless the church here, they can help redeem it in a culture that openly attacks biblical views. When you have a white evangelical advocating for this, God bless them, it's one thing. But when you have a Latino advocating, the moment you come against that Latino, you're coming against an ethnicity and a minority. It serves as a firewall against the assault. Crosby warns church leaders about the consequences if they ignore this key demographic. To me, uh, churches that choose not to become multi-ethnic are losing and will lose. The strongest presence and growth that we've experienced has come from the Latin community. River of Life Church is also attracting Latinos from all backgrounds, but it hasn't always been that way. The area was predominantly white when the church first opened its doors. As Hispanics arrived, the church adapted. We've tried to be intentional in representing our community um, and those on the platform and then those that are uh, working with people. Crosby and Rodriguez say churches that welcome Latinos tend to become, quote, salsified, not only passionate in their faith, but pursuing salvation and social justice. The vast majority of evangelical churches in America in the next 20 years will be both vertical and horizontal churches, will be both Billy Graham and Dr. King. Latinos are doing that mm -hmm. because we're not either or, we're both and. Mm -hmm. So we will be a very healthy church committed to righteousness, but likewise committed to biblical justice in the name of Jesus. You open your heart to Latinos in your community and you will bless your church because you'll be bringing in people that not only want to get right with God, but they're very concerned about their neighbors, their communities. Pastors told us Latinos have made their congregations more focused on the Holy Spirit and emphasize that church is family. And they're not just serving, they're leading with a holistic vision of ministry at a time when the church needs it. But I think white evangelicals still look at the Latino church as a minority church. 
that's looking for this, and we're not looking for a handout. We're actually looking for this. Kingdom collaboration. Collaboration that could revitalize the church in this country. Reporting in Tampa, Heather Sells, CBN News. Kingdom collaboration, I love that term. You know, it ought to be about community always. I sometimes think it's a shame that we don't have the ability to enjoy the differences in each other when God obviously had so much fun creating such diversity. It's nice to hear that that's invading our churches. Well, up next, parents who were given two options, let their son die in their arms or watch him die in the OR. And I remember looking at Andrew and saying, Andrew, I am your mother and you will live and I'll see you when you get out. See how their son beat insurmountable odds when we return. If you're approaching 65, now's the time to get your ducks in a row to learn about Medicare and the options you have. You see, Medicare doesn't cover everything only about 80% of your Part B medical expenses. The rest is up to you. So if 65 is around the corner, think about an AARP Medicare Supplement Insurance Plan insured by United Healthcare Insurance Company. Like all standardized Medicare Supplement Insurance Plans, they help cover some of what Medicare doesn't pay and could save you in out-of-pocket medical costs. So don't wait. Call to request your free decision guide and gather the information now to help you choose a plan later. These types of plans let you pick any doctor or hospital that takes Medicare patients. And there's a range of plans to choose from, depending on your needs and your budget. So if you're turning 65 soon, call now and get started. Because the time to think about tomorrow is today. Go long. Let's take a look at some numbers. Four out of five people who have a stroke, their first symptom is a stroke. 80% of all strokes and heart disease, preventable. And $149 is all it takes to get screened and help take control of your health. We're Lifeline Screening. And if you're over 50, call this number to schedule an appointment for five painless screenings that go beyond regular checkups. We use ultrasound technology to literally look inside your arteries for plaque which builds up as you age and increases your risk for stroke and cardiovascular disease. And by getting them through this package, you're saving over 50%. So call today and consider these numbers. For just $149, you'll receive five screenings that could reveal what your body isn't telling you. And I'm going to tell you that's the best $150 I've ever spent in my life. Lifeline Screening. The power of prevention. Call now to learn more. Andrew Anzavino was just 12 hours old when he needed life-saving surgery, and his problems didn't end after he left the operating table. Before his first birthday, Andrew had to overcome a host of problems, from chicken pox to the rotavirus to a staph infection, and all without an immune system. Through it all, his parents held on to a promise of life, and here's why. When I delivered Andrew, at first the doctor looked a little puzzled and I said, there's so there seems like there's something wrong because he's blue and my other children weren't that color. And then I knew that there, there was something tragically wrong with this child. When Kristen Ann Zavino delivered her third child, Andrew, she and her husband Bill received shocking news. Well, the doctor came in and he said he's, he's not dead, um, but we do have to call in a life flight team. Andrew was born with partial DeGeorge syndrome, a condition that can have 180 side effects, including the underdevelopment of Andrew's pulmonary arteries. Their doctor offered them little hope. They were gonna fly him to a hospital in Pittsburgh, and they thought from what he looked like, he had a heart defect of some sort. And he says, I'm not sure if he'll make it. And um, do you want someone to come in and do the last rites? I just laid there and I thought, I, I cannot believe you think you're going to go in and have this baby and you're going to be coming home with this little baby. I had two other little children at home and I'm thinking this cannot be happening. Bill was instantly reminded of a story from the New Testament and heard a voice speaking to him. Like a flash, I just remember the story of Jairus in the Bible where he was told, be not afraid, only believe, even though his child had already died. 
fear not, only believe. I said, we believe. He said those words, and um, there was something about it that was scary, but there was also something about it that overtook your fear, and you thought, okay, he's going to, he's going to make it. When Andrew arrived at Pittsburgh's Children's Hospital, the doctors discovered he had no left pulmonary artery. And when they came into the room, these two head cardiologists at Children's Hospital, and they just said, look, we've got good news for you and bad news to you, for you. The good news is Andrew is still alive. The bad news is he needs surgery now. He's only 14 hours old. Here's your options. We could bring him here into the room and let you hold him and let him die in your arms. Or we can take that, him into the surgery room and let him die there. Those are your two options. The Anzavinos opted for surgery, but continued to believe for their baby's healing. But I do remember thinking, okay, well just do what you have to do. God's gonna get him through this. And um, they said, you could come out and see him go through the hallway. And I remember going out and he was in this, the same little incubator. And I remember looking at Andrew and saying, Andrew, I am your mother and you will live and you will grow up and you're gonna have a prosperous and a productive life. And you're gonna listen to me. You are going to live and I'll see you when you get out. Andrew survived the surgery, but a host of other health issues began to surface. You know, it was one wave after another of bad news. So the next bad, bit of bad news was there was no thymus. Which means the immune system is like an AIDS patient, which means he can't fight off any sickness or disease at all. Still, the Anzavinos continued to believe for Andrew's healing, and Andrew continued to amaze his doctors. So within the first nine months of his life without an immune system, he overcame a staph infection in the heart, a Broviac line infection, then the chicken pock infection, and fourthly, the rotavirus infection without an immune system, which we believe was by the hand of God. You know, we would pray together and we had this set of scriptures and I, he wrote these scriptures down on a piece of paper. I mean, there would be days that I wouldn't sleep. I would take out those scriptures that he wrote down for me and I would just say them and I would look at them as, this is medicine and I declared it and it has to work, it has to respond. Of course, Mark 11, 23 and 24, speak to your mountain, command it to go and it will go. Um, the next verse, verse 24, believe you receive and you will have. But also Psalm 118, verse 17 that says, I will not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. Um, and then 1 Peter 2, 24, with his stripes we were healed. Andrew's biggest hurdle, however, was the lack of a pulmonary artery. And so we said, Lord, they said he doesn't have one. We're asking you to give him one. And we believe we receive a left pulmonary artery for Andrew. And we started thanking him for that. And during the catheterization, they discovered that, okay, he's got a thread for a left pulmonary artery. And that thread is almost like the tip of a pin when it's supposed to be the size of a eraser, like a pencil eraser, and this artery is never going to grow because where there is no blood, there is no growth. Periodically, they would come in and like, uh, do a, an echosonogram and, and look at the artery. And I remember they would try to measure it. One time the doctor came in and he was doing the scan and he said, oh, I could see it. It's a little bit bigger. I said, see, I told you it's getting bigger. So for us to hear that it was a thread was exciting. For them, it meant nothing. But we believe that from nothing to a thread means the beginning of a miracle. At nine months, Andrew was scheduled for a catheterization to repair his artery. But prior to the surgery, one of the doctors noticed something unusual. He grabbed me in the hallway and goes, it worked, it worked. It's, it's the right size, it doesn't even need repaired. And I said, I know, I knew it was going to grow. Over the next several years, Andrew continued to overcome every obstacle he faced. I was very tenacious about what I believed. And he had to say 11 words by the time he was three for him to go to regular preschool. And would you believe it? He said 11 words. And I was like, count them, count them. He says 11 words, he can go to preschool. Today, Andrew is a healthy 16-year-old who knows God has a special plan for his life. I really love to play the piano and I go on my phone, type in YouTube, search up any song I want, and then just learn it from there. Like in the future, I like to play for a worship team, and I study God's Word all the time. And 
Mark 9, 23. All things are possible to my leave, and I said every morning. He's a powerful witness for Jesus in school, and unashamedly does he share his faith, unashamedly. The Anzavinos tell his story in their book, We Believe. They were assuming he would die, and yet he's 16. I mean, we go to visit the doctor for our checkups, and they're like, he could just live as long as anybody else. They don't even know what to expect from him. They're, he's just a walking miracle. That is a miracle. They spoke as if it was real, as if it was already accomplished, and they began to thank God for it. That's biblical. That is biblical. I don't know what your need in your life is. You know, it might be financial. It might be something relational with someone that you're out of relationship with in your life right now. It might be some kind of addiction. God is able, more than able. That child had no left ventricular whatever it was he needed, and God created it. He made it out of nothing. It's how he made you and me. And so we can ask for this. He's the creator of the universe. There's nothing too small or too big for him. I want to build your faith also with Donna, who lives in Shreveport, Louisiana. She developed weakness and pain in her right shoulder. One day she was watching this program, and Pat gave a word of knowledge. He said, there's a muscular weakness in the shoulder right now, and it's the right shoulder. Donna said immediately the pain and the weakness she had been experiencing was completely gone. You know, sometimes it happens like that. It's immediate. Sometimes it happens over a window of time. Sometimes it's from nothing. God will do what he will do his way. The question is, will we trust him? Will we believe for it? Will we declare it? And sometimes you have to do that when you don't even see it yet. I want to pray with you today. I don't know what your need is, but I know that God is big. I know that he hears you. I know that he sees you and that every detail of what goes on in your life matters to him. And here's the thing. He uses it all. Whether he does it the way you think he'll do it or not, he uses it all. So let's pray together and let's just invite him into the middle of your need right now. Jesus, we just ask you now, as you do see each one of us, as you do hear every prayer, you say in your word that sometimes you reach out and you meet our need before we even speak it to you. Today, would you testify to your children of who you are by your glory and your power and the magnitude of your presence in their lives, God? Would you touch them at their point of need? Would you give vision where there's no vision? Would you give the ability to hear where there is deafness? Would you heal now in the mighty matchless name of Jesus? We pray for people who are in impossible situations with diagnoses that are dire. I just pray an outpouring of a spirit of hope and faith and belief. I pray that you would send people to your word, God, that they would stand on it and be delivered because of your greatness and your majesty and your power. We, we just bow down before you today and we say thank you before we ever see the work of your hand. Thank you, thank you for your presence, for your love. Thank you for making a difference in our lives. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you've got something specific and you'd like to pray with someone about it, we always have prayer warriors on our prayer lines and there's our number right there. It's toll free, it's 1-800-707-000. So you call now. Well, still ahead, she's a single mom who used to have to decide between getting gas to go to work and putting food on the table. Find out why she no longer needs to make that choice and that's next. And welcome back to the 700 Club. A Maryland abortion clinic known for providing late-term abortions is not only closing its doors, it's being sold to a pro-life group. Dr. Leroy Carhart moved his practice out of Nebraska after late-term abortions were banned there. He started up in Maryland seven years ago. But Christians living in the area mobilized and created the Maryland Coalition for Life. Volunteers quickly began peacefully praying in front of his clinic, and a pregnancy help center was opened right across the street. Finally, the abortion clinic closed because of low demand and years of seeing those protests. 
and the Maryland Coalition for Life purchased the property. Three U.S. Army Special Forces soldiers were killed and two were wounded in the West African nation of Niger on Wednesday. Pentagon sources tell CBN News the deaths occurred in an ambush by suspected Islamist militants in the region. The Army Green Berets are the first casualties from a mission in which the U.S. Special Forces are providing training to Niger's armed forces. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Tara will be back with much more of the 700 Club coming up right after this. Erica is a single mom who works two jobs, and she also homeschools her young son. There have been times when she had to choose between going to work and putting food on her table. Well, that's no longer the case because of help that Erica got from Operation Blessing. Take a look. Erica and her son Jeremiah love spending time being active together. I work at a gym and I teach gymnastics and so I guess it was kind of natural that he picked it up. He actually started competing last year and so far so good. <laughs> Erica decided to homeschool her son so he could keep his education centered on God. My mom loves me a lot and I love my mom a lot. I like being homeschooled because my mom can teach me. Everything he learns pretty much comes from God's Word. We're at church many times a week and there's never a complaint from Jeremiah about going to church. He's always excited and ready to go. I do love Jesus and I love Him because He loves me and he died on the cross for my sins. It's a real blessing to know that the Lord is working in his heart and in his life. She works long hours to provide for her son. I'm a single mom. I have to work two jobs to make ends meet. I work for Chesapeake Parks and Recreation. I teach preschool classes, and then I also work for Hurricane Gymnastics, where I'm a gymnastics coach. Finances are very tight. It definitely is a struggle. Erica said her faith in God sustains her. There's been many, many nights after Jeremiah goes to bed, I'm just in my room on my knees. I take that opportunity to spend time with God and to give my burdens to Him. When the bills have piled up, she's made some tough choices. Many times I've had to say, okay, either we're gonna eat today or we're gonna have gas to get to work today. And usually when it comes down to it, I have to choose gas because if I don't go to work, then there is no other income coming in. It's hard when you realize food in the cabinet's kind of running out and there's no money in the bank account to buy more food to replace it. When a friend at church told Erica about Operation Blessing Partner, House of Blessing, she knew God had answered her prayers. I've been helped greatly to know that my son doesn't have to go hungry. To sit down and share my story with somebody who cares and then for them to pray with me. I not only leave with my trunk full of groceries, I leave with my spirit renewed and my heart full of love. Having that prayer support and being able to put food on the table has lifted a heavy burden. I just want to thank everybody who gives and sacrifices what they have to give to Operation Blessing so that not just my family, but so many families can be helped and blessed by this ministry. Not only are you helping to feed our families, but you're feeding our spirits. You're helping people experience God's love firsthand. Thank you for giving to Operation Blessing and blessing my family. This is one hard-working single mom who's pouring everything she's got into the life of her son and who's doing everything she can to make that possible. You know, sometimes no matter how much you do, no matter how hard you work, you just can't make ends meet. Well, one of the things that happens when you join the 700 Club is that you give us an opportunity to speak into the lives of people like Erica. Not a handout, but a hand up as she continues to work hard, homeschool her son, and move forward positively in her life. We say thank you. 
What does that cost? 65 cents a day, $20 a month, makes you a 700 Club member. If you haven't already joined, today's a great day to do it. Our number is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. When you do, we want to send you Pat's latest. It's called Ask Anything. You hear some of the questions that are answered on this program. Well, this is even more probing questions about life. People wanting to know, what does God say? What does the Word of God say about this? It's our gift to you when you join the 700 Club. So please call now. Well, still ahead, the woman who led the fight to bring Jenna's law into the nation's schools and rescue the victims of sexual abuse. She joins us live when we return. Quinn was 17 years old when a reporter approached her about featuring her story. Jenna agreed, but she wanted to be seen as a victor, not a victim. And since then, she's done the same for other survivors of sexual abuse. Jenna Quinn is a child abuse prevention advocate, speaker, and author. She helped implement Jenna's Law, which requires sex abuse education in Texas. Today, similar legislation has been mandated in over half of America's schools. And while she knows all the statistics about child sex abuse, her fight against this epidemic comes from her own personal experience. Jenna was 13 when her best friend's father sexually assaulted her for the first time. Intense shame, fear, and withdrawal followed. Then, after three years of suffering in silence, she finally broke free from the abuse and brought her tormentor to justice. In her book, Pure in Heart, Jenna shares her journey through sexual assault, from fear to forgiveness. She gives warning signs to look for and offers hope to survivors. Jenna Quinn is here with us now to share her story. Welcome. It's so good to have you here. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Jenna, how did this all start for you? So he started grooming me when I was 12 years old. And he was a very close family friend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my best friend's father, really. Yeah. I mean, imagine the families family that you do. family friend, because your yes. two families were very close to each other. Yes. Yeah. And imagine who you do life with, you know, holidays, vacations. Yeah. And little did I know that uh, someone who was very close to me mm -hmm. um, in my life uh, would sexually abuse me for yeah. three years. And, and these perpetrators, they really, they're very strategic and they pick their victims. You're not the first them. victim. No. No, it's not. When these things would happen to you, um, what did it make you feel? Well, I felt feelings I'd never felt before after the first mm -hmm. incident of assault. And I felt shame, intense yeah. shame, and, and blame, and fear, and guilt. And I felt an isolation and a separation yeah. um, that I had never felt before. It, you know, that's such a common reaction on the part yeah. of people. And sometimes I think people have a hard time understanding that. Well, why would you feel guilt? But children do. How did you, how did you deal with that? I mean, you really started acting out in some ways that were totally contrary to who you were before this. Yes, because I was threatened not to tell, um, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And you know, David said it best in the Psalms. He said, when I was silent, my bones wasted away. Yeah. And so by not being able to say something or tell someone or expose this evil, I suffered. And, you know, not just emotionally, but behaviorally, I started mm -hmm. to change. Yeah. I went from being outgoing to withdrawn and very depressed and suicidal. And then people start judging you as if you're out of kilter and something's wrong with you personally because they don't understand the root cause of all of this because nothing's being spoken. So you had teachers and mm -hmm. friends and... Um, even some family members who were kind of like, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. What's the matter with you? Why are you acting like this? Yes. And, you know, the adults around me were never educated on what those warning signs sure. are. You know, how to recognize, how to prevent, and, and how to report, how to ask a child if this is something that's uh, happening. And, and let's be honest, you know, it's not really something that people want. They don't want to go there in their minds. Of course that not. This is happening to this young girl and this family. What are the warning signs? Share those with us. 
Well, there are several warning signs. Um, the biggest is just look for those changes in behavior. Mm -hmm. Sudden changes in emotion, sudden changes in mood, sudden changes in behavior. Uh, Can be school related, school, in homework. The school, failing grades. I went mm -hmm. from making good grades to failing. Um, withdrawn, um, depression, insomnia, and actually, believe it or not, cutting, self-harm yeah. is a very strong correlator with. When did you speak out and why? What, what, what made you finally decide to say something? So my older sister, um, the Holy Spirit really put it on her heart to ask because a specific incident happened over Thanksgiving break where we were just roughhousing, you know, going mm -hmm. up the stairs and she grabbed my ankle and she said, ha ha ha, I'm gonna get you. And that was a trigger to me. Mm -hmm. And so I stormed up to my room and I was angry with her and I said, that's not funny and I slammed the door. Well, she went back and she couldn't focus on her finals for Christmas. Um, the God entire time, she was, yeah, yeah she, it, it was on her mind so badly that the next uh, day, the day after Christmas, you know, we had spent Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with uh, the perpetrator's family mm. uh, because we spent holidays, birthdays, vacations with them. And, and that's how this happens. I mean, over 90% of the time, a child is sexually abused by someone. Well, that and I want to mention know. that the stats are one in three girls yes. and one in six boys yeah. will be sexually molested by someone in their lifetime. That's a staggering yeah. number. It's a very staggering number, and it doesn't sit well with most people, and, and it shouldn't. Ultimately, you went to court with this. That had to be a very difficult thing to do. I mean, this is the kind of thing you want to stuff in the back of the closet and never have to think about again. The guy, the family friend, got 20 years, but you know, here you are, your families had relationships with each other. You were friends with his children. Your one voice saying that this has happened, you, took, you put a lot on the line to do this. Did you feel any better once that had happened? Once I made my outcry mm -hmm. and you know, exposed um, the evil that was being done, I did feel better. Um, but it really wasn't until the night before the trial yeah. that um, the Lord, I was in my um, quiet time with the Lord, and he led me to the book of Matthew where it talks about praying for those and yeah. blessing those mm -hmm. who persecute you. And I thought, how can I do that? How can I do that? You know, how can you ask me to do that? But I knew that, um, you know, God's word is true. And then if I did what he said, he would be faithful. And so I prayed, I prayed blessing, I prayed forgiveness over my offender. Even though you didn't feel like it. Yeah. Even <laughs> though I didn't feel like it. I wanted the Lord to know that I was trying. Mm -hmm. I, I see what you're telling me to do. I understand what you want me to do, I'm gonna pray. So I prayed, I prayed these prayers, and I asked that my emotions would follow the words that I was praying. Yeah. And they did. And you know, there's something in forgiveness that we think sometimes we're forgiving the other person. We're not, we're really releasing them to God and in that release, we become free. I mean, what a journey you have been on. And now Jenna's Law um, exists around the country and it's protecting children because you had the courage to speak up. It's really quite wonderful. I wanna mention uh, that Jenna has a book. If you or someone you know needs help, uh, we want you to read this book. It's called Pure in Heart, but you should also call the Child Abuse Hotline. It's an 800 toll-free number. It's 1-800-4-A-CHILD. You can also go to cbn.com for additional resources, but get a hold of the book, Pure in Heart. It's available wherever books are sold and well worth your read and talk to your children. Talk, talk, talk to your children. Jenna, thank you. Thank you. So great to have you with us. Well, we want to leave you with these words from Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. That's not a maybe, that's a promise. We hope that's a promise that's true in your life. God bless you. See you tomorrow.